Fish is almost ready to harvest after a year. Good thing number 126332237A. Go for 3.9. Go 1.43 kilograms. Go transgenic sibling. Go 4.97 kilograms. It's a technology that cannot exist with nature. It's a technology that invades, pollutes, contaminates, and ultimately destroys the natural species. And this is fundamental, whether it be crops or fish or animals. That's the fundamental nature of biological pollution. It, it, it cannot coexist. It invades and destroys. We need to understand that as we debate this issue. But, but the real key here is not the salmon. The salmon is just the first product. What we're really interested in and what we're working on uh, now back in the lab is a tilapia and a carp, uh, which are <clears throat> really important um, fish in the third world, in China, in Africa, uh, for food security. Um, we're going to have difficulty supplying aquatic protein to, to people uh, worldwide, and not just the high-end kind of products like trout and salmon, but the really important products for food security like tilapia and carp. And those are what we're working on. We should have those on the market by the end of the decade. That is the real point of the whole matter. The focus is on conquering the huge market in southeastern Asia. Aqua Bounty Farms is getting ready to breed and sell eggs, manipulated with growth genes, in huge amounts. The company conducts the scanty tests required for approval itself and no other independent scientists or consumers have insight into the approval process. It is confidential. Occasional reports that the modified fish are more aggressive, suffer from internal as well as external deformities, and die earlier. The same results reached in earlier experiments on pigs, cows, and sheep give due cause for skepticism. At Purdue University in Indiana, Bill Muir and Rick Howard are performing tests and doing pioneer research work to determine what actually happens when genetically modified fish, like those soon to be introduced to the market, enter the food chain and mingle with wild fish. For this purpose, Rick Howard and Bill Muir developed a computer model in which they created a population of 60,000 wild fish into which 60 transgenic fish penetrate. The more aggressive feeding and mating behavior of the larger transgenic males led, in the most extreme case, to the extinction of the entire fish population after around 40 generations, that is, within a few years. They are now doing research in their experimental aquariums to find out if these scenarios can be confirmed in reality. research that we're doing here and looking at the transgenic mating advantage and so forth is, is very unique because there, we know of no other lab in the world that is looking at the success of uh, transgenic individuals and wild type individuals. And actually transgenic organisms like fish can get into the environment in the first place uh, would most likely be an accidental occurrence where there would be either an impoundment or a fenced uh, area in the ocean that the fish would escape from and then go into the natural populations. And every year thousands and thousands of fish escape from these types of, of situations. So it's a very common type of event. There is a uh, storm off the coast of Maine a couple of years ago that destroyed some of the uh, enclosures that Atlantic salmon were being farmed in. And in that one storm, 100,000 fish escaped. So 
they can escape from these situations and they can escape in great numbers. This fish, if let loose through biological pollution in the natural waters, will destroy the native fish. It's very important to think that this, once this biological contamination is very different than chemical contamination, if you have an oil spill, it will dilute over time. Even a chemical spill will dilute over time. This is not chemical pollution. This is about living pollution, biological pollution. Once these fish are released into a bay or a river, you can't recall them. No scientist can say, come back, please. Or you can't put a net and get them. It's over. It's over. And in the United States, we have yet to have our first law. We don't have a single law which regulates this kind of biological pollution. It is completely unregulated, even though its effects will be catastrophic and you will not be able to, to remedy those, you'll not be able to recall this. There are certainly environmental hazards <clears throat> associated with transgenic animals, um, and particularly with fish, because they can escape and they're free-ranging after that. It's real hard to find one after they get out as the, as the salmon farming industry has discovered on its own. In order to protect against the fish either colonizing new habitat or uh, interbreeding with, with wild fish, what we're doing is developing a fish that is uh, our, our production line uh, fish that will be sold will be sterile uh, so that they can't reproduce and they will be all female and the reason why they're all female is because um, sterile female salmon tend not to come back from the ocean they, they, they have no reason to come back to the rivers to spawn because they, they never mature one of the things that I find so curious about the argument of the biotechnology companies that often call themselves life sciences is that when you talk to them about the environmental threats, about all the other threats, they say, don't worry, we are making genetically engineered fish sterile. We're going to make sure they're sterile. By the way, who checks on this? Millions of fish being sterile is a ridiculous enforcement idea. Don't worry, uh, biological pollution of plants. We're going to put a terminator technology in these plants so they'll commit suicide after one growing season. And I find it very strange that a company that calls itself Life Sciences is telling us that their technology only will work if we make all life on Earth sterile. Uh, what a terrifying concept. The so-called Terminator technology makes the farmers almost completely dependent on the corporations. The plants are genetically modified in such a way that they are able to germinate only once. Sowing the harvest seeds is pointless. The harvest is dead. Genetic engineering, uh, to some extent, is a, about a 400-year-old mistake. It was a mistake that began with the Cartesian Revolution and this idea that life is a machine. Uh, uh, Descartes said that, you know, that basically animals are bet machines, that animals are basically machines. And the Cartesians would vivisect uh, 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 cats and dogs, and when they would hear the screams, they would say, aha, this is like the gears shifting in the machine. That's where this noise is coming from. I think this was a totally mechanistic vision. And if you trace the last 400 years, you can see there's been a certain part of the scientific community, and by no means all, that has continued this mechanistic myth, very dangerous myth. So now that they see the entire living world as simply machines and genes as the software, that's why they believe in genetic engineering. They're engineering life as if they were engineering machines. You know, they're reductionist, efficiency, exactly the same principles that you use in the machine they're trying to reduce life to. That's the fundamental mistake of genetic engineering.